so these are disclosures, and the, I will tell you about Select Technologies because this is a company that I was part of founding, and I'll share a little bit of that with you, but this is not all about Selects. Um, we're gonna, but between Johnny and I, talk about cells and the opportunities that exist today to not only use cells that come from you, which are referred to as autogenous cells, and these can come from blood, bone marrow, fat, muscle, skin. We already use cells in a variety of ways, and Johnny will spend a lot of his time talking about those things that you can do today, and that's also where I started because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that. There's also an opportunity to use cells from other people in the same way that you can use kidneys from other people to restore life. Uh, there are sources of cells that we can envision obtaining from healthy people that have all the things we want and then transplanting them. But then we have to, of course, deal with the, with the immune acceptance of those cells. And then, of course, we also deal with allografts all the time, kidney, liver, heart. Those have been part of our lives for, and they're all cell transplants. When we transplant an organ, we not only transplant the current function of the organ, but we transplant all of the stem cells that are necessary to maintain its life throughout the life of the recipient. And see, this is all part of stem cell biology. What Johnny and I will have the opportunity to talk about today is a little bit about bone and marrow drive cells, and then about culture expanded cells and kind of the next wave. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of these things, cell therapy goals, the process, the concept of stem cells and what they are, uh, some strategies that we use today in the operating room, uh, and then the opportunities that's emerging that you all hear about for using more advanced ways to envision cells, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent cells. And then Johnny will come back to talk about today things that we can do with, to potentially improve longevity, understand aging, and, and, and maintain our health as well as restore our health. So both of us have the privilege of working in organizations where one, you kind of inspire others and live in an environment of transparency where it's free, you're free to ask questions, you're free to ask what if, and you're, you're expected to participate in a, in, a, in a larger scale group because what we can do together is clearly much more than what we can do as individuals. As smart as people think they are, we've solved most of the problems that you can solve by yourself. Uh, Mentoring and collaboration, this is actually a, one of Kathy, Kathy's drawing. My wife's an artist, so this is a, one of her pieces. So we also <laughs> live in this environment of innovation, and in my thinking, there are three important pieces of that. The first is that responsibility, privilege, and skill in asking the right question. The first one is usually, how are you? as a physician, as a friend, as a family member, but also the, the experiment of, well, what if we did this? Could that make things better? Because that's the scientific question. Uh, 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 over dinner tonight, I'll tell you about one, some of you, if you're interested about my, my, um, one of my heroes in, in, in science who asked the question, why don't we turn to stone? And it was a great question. It's, had, it's impacted millions of people's lives, and I'll have to tell you about that later because we, we don't have time now. Um, but then important problems, restoring health, but also preserving health, and then thinking about that by creating opportunities for others to share, to teach, to encourage, to guide, to lead. This is an environment that we have to live in, and a larger scale environment of not only accelerators of the things that we do, and a respect for the regulators of things that we do. Um, because people's lives are part of this, society has to fund a lot of this. And so there is the National Institutes of Health, which funds a tremendous amount of work every year, not enough, in <clears throat> advancing knowledge, educating new scientists, sharing data and creating data sharing resources. The National Science Foundation that that facilitates the generation of tools and technologies that can be applied to anywhere, whether it's space or a Petri dish. 
the National Institute for Standards and Technology who help us define standards and work together in collaborative groups to decide what do we call things. If we all call something a stem cell, and, and we use the word stem cell to refer to every cell that we like or every cell that we think is valuable or every cell that we think will help or every cell that we can make money on, then that's a tragedy and it, it inhibits our ability to communicate. And so NIST is a place where that can happen. Philanthropy speeds the process, provides agility to the process. Equity is the next regulator because people who are gonna invest money have to be part of that process of thinking, is this valuable enough? Is this better than the alternative? And is it worth helping a company provide this to people? Because none of these good ideas get into people's hands, into your hands or our hands, unless it goes through a process that brings it to us safely and navigates the next set of the Federal Food and Drug Administration who care about safety and efficacy, and the Federal Trade Commission that cares about truth in advertising. And so everything we do has to be done in this just systematic concept of this is how we create innovation, and this is also how we protect each other from misinformation. The process of taking a, anything into clinical practice, we did this mostly with drugs, we're now doing it with cells, is through a very organized process. So there's preclinical things that you can do in a lab or in animals uh, that just say, is this, is there any reason to think this might work? Is there a mechanism of action that says that this is gonna help people? And then there's a series of clinical trials. And many of you, how many of people have been part of a clinical trial? So one, two, three, so it's, it's about five or 10% of the room that has been part of a clinical trial. And many people assume that, well, the scientist comes up with a great idea, it works in the Petri dish, I can buy it tomorrow. And the clinical trial process is part of this system that protects us, but also informs us because there's a first phase, phase one clinical trial, where 10 people might get it. This is like the Normandy Beach. If you're part of a phase one clinical trial, the honest way to approach you is that we don't know if this is gonna work. We think it would work. We've done everything we can before giving it to a human to test that it's safe but we don't know if this is gonna help you and we don't even know if it's gonna hurt you. And we're actually gonna test different doses and probably we won't stop escalating the dose until we do start to hurt somebody. And I don't know if that'll be you or not. That's the phase one clinical trial. But it has to be done. I can't test a new bone grafting material and then open it up so 14 year old girls who are getting scoliosis surgery are exposed to it without first testing it under very controlled conditions and a limited number of people waiting long enough so if there are adverse effects, effects and, then, and then moving forward. Phase two clinical trials go to the next step of testing not just is it safe and how much can people tolerate of this stuff, but does it have a big enough, a big enough effect for them to care about, it, for it to be clinically meaningful? There can be effects that are measurable, but not big enough to make a big enough difference. Because you're always comparing things to the alternative. And then, so there might be 100, 200 people, even 300 people in a phase two trial. And they're very tightly constrained, so it's just certain types of people, certain age groups, sometimes even certain genders, even certain ethnicity may be limiting because that's where the problem is focused. Um, black men with renal failure, for example. Um, and then if it passes that test, then you open up to phase three trials. Now you may be talking about two to three to 10,000 people where the question is, is this generalizable? Other than that limited group of people who got this at phase two, can I safely give it to larger groups of people and relax those constraints? And are there some people who are gonna be just responders? and some people who are gonna be non-responders and try to measure that and discover before it opened up for clinical use where you could still hurt people, where you could help people, so people can use it and physicians can prescribe it in a, in a responsible way. And then there's downstream, after something is available, 
measuring how it performs in the market 10 years after the fact, you might discover things. Um, you know, thalidomide wasn't discovered as a problem for years after the fact that it was, it was released. It would have been discovered much earlier now, even in phase one, but, but at the time it was the post-surveillance that, that made a, a difference. So I'm gonna have to go faster, but this is the kind of the basics of what we're talking about and the world that Johnny and I both have to think in and we're all of us I think are responsible players and thank you for all of you who are part of clinical trials because that's how we learn together. So there's also this challenge that something is exciting going on and, and then I leave <coughs> O'Hare Airport in a cab and see this sign <coughs> and sends chills down my spine, right? <laughs> Uh, because, you know, on one hand, we're all looking for that magic bullet. We would like to make this work so that whatever we're providing to people is just as reliable as the drug we get from Starbucks. <clears throat> but there's also possible to not have done the work behind it and not know what you're doing and just be selling steak oil. And so it's still possible. And there's medicine is filled with these stories. So we have to be careful in the area of cell therapy not to overhype it and not to skip steps because this is where people not only may risk their health, but waste their time as well. So, now I'm gonna go faster, because that's the, that's the basic background. And the stem cell biology about it is, is a little more fun, and it's a little more process, and I'm not gonna make you scientists, but uh, I'll tell you about the thinking that at least has taken place in, in, in my world. So first is, you and I are living in a river. Two weeks from now, we will wake up and comb our hair or shave, and we will look at ourselves, and we will look the same. But, all the skin on our face has changed. The lining of our mouth has changed three times during that time. The lining of our intestines has changed three times during that time. A year from now, half of the fat that we have will be replaced by new fat. Maybe half of the muscle will be replaced about every, what, four or five years, Johnny? Half of the bone will be replaced every 25 years. And so we're constantly renewing ourselves and that process is necessary one, there is injury and senescence, but there has to be an upstream source of cells in our body that is capable of replacing the tissues we're losing and the tissue we need to repair injury. So that balance we can think about is the, almost a definition of health. These cells exist in skin, ready to heal our cuts, in our intestines, in our bloodstream, in our bones, so that if I fracture, <clears throat> I have a 95% chance of healing almost no matter what my orthopedic surgeon does. Uh, and the way in which those tissues form is fairly consistent. There's a cell that is generally resting, so I'll go up here at the very top of this, there's a cell that's resting, and in response to some signals, normal signals, it will divide, replace itself, but then it, it'll create daughter cells that expand. I only have six levels of expansion. It's probably usually more like 16 to 20 levels of expansion, so you get a lot of mature cells every time you double the number of cells that you have. And, and these cells from, from this start, starting cell, the, found, the stem cell, which replaces itself, that's the definition of a stem cell, and the progenitor cells that are committed to doing something, <coughs> um, that, that space is, is, is a process of generating mature cells that then can live for as long as 25, 30 years in your body, even longer. Uh, these cells have, universally, regardless of the organ, uh, have the capacity to make new tissues, to communicate, sometimes over long distances, like with hormones, sometimes over short distances through signals called cytokines. They make matrix, they, make, they build, build structure around them, which is the, why, our, why we don't just drop, our bones have structure, our organs have structure. Um, they provide surveillance in our immune system and constantly circulate. Yeah. But they also have to die at the right time because if they don't die, then they either linger and don't help us, but consume space and resources, or they may divide and form a cancer. So this is the, at the threshold, the stem cell biology is kind of in the threshold of not only healing and health, but also 
also, um, also the generation of cancer. Now, I got involved as an orthopedic surgeon because 90 to 95% of the time, I don't have to do very much to allow my patients to heal their fractures, but 10% of the time, particularly in the tibias you see here, things don't heal. And it can be because there's an infection, it can be because it, the blood supply has been so badly damaged, and in that case, we have treatments that can do it, that can help. It could be due to instability. This is where plates and screws and things like that come about. But this is somebody who failed 10 times with previous physicians before they saw me. And the problem was that there just weren't any cells around that were capable of making bone anymore. And so in this situation, this is where a cellular therapy starts to become necessary because you just can't grow corn in a desert without corn seeds or water and other things. But so the questions that ask an important question, there are a lot of them here. What cells do we want? How can they be assayed? Where are they? How can we harvest them? How can we transplant them? You know, how could we, you know, is there a clinical need for them? Is there testing? What are the regulatory barriers? These are all important questions. And so my lab started with the basic science questions of how can you find them? How can you measure them? And we've used this type of an assay system, not unlike in your garden, if you've got a handful of dirt, you don't know how many seeds are there. You throw it out into the garden, water it, and in, in a soil you think is fertile and find out how many plants grow and now you've got a measure of how, many, how valuable that hand of dirt was in terms of the seeds that were present. So this is an example of 10 million cells from a young person that was thrown into a dish under conditions where a bone forming cell might form and now I can count the number of colonies that formed. Each one of these colonies was formed by a single cell that hit the dish, divided, and so now I've got, you, you may have done this in, your, in, in high school with, your, with bacterial plaques and measuring, measuring growth in a sponge, but this is now you know, truly progenitor cells or stem cells, I don't know which, but they're cells that are capable of proliferating and cont contributing to new tissue formation. And so we can measure them using this type of tool. We worked for a long time in ways to improve fracture repair using density separation, and Johnny's gonna talk, I think, probably a lot about a centrifuge and using centrifuge to isolate sets of cells and exclude others. Using selective retention, the fact that cells will preferentially attack to some surfaces, and we can use that behavior to concentrate or select them, as well as methods for magnetic separation. So these are things that are available to surgeons in the operating room today, at, at least not, not magnetic separation yet, except for cancer therapy, but, but for bone healing, for density separation and selective retention are both available. <clears throat> but then there's the other question. We can do those things, which are autologous cells, and I'm gonna leave that to Johnny. But then there's a the question, well, is this enough? It, wouldn't it be nice if, if we only had, say, 50 cells to begin with? Well, now we've got 100,000 cells if I just keep letting them grow, I can get a million, I can get 10 million, I can get 100 million, I can get a billion cells, wouldn't more be better? And so there is the, the large part of the world that has worked on this strategy of taking all of those cells that, that started to make those colonies, continuing to feed them, allow them to grow over each other and compete with each other, and then at the end, end up with something which the world in, in bone biology is called mesenchymal stromal cells, which might make bone, they might help cartilage, they might have different effects. And it would be nice if they did, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, and part of the reason that they sometimes do and sometimes don't is that if you culture everything that's in the dish, the end result is dependent on what you started with. And you didn't control what you chose to be part of the group. So if this is a handful that includes uh, um, you know, columbine as well as dandelions, I don't know whether the columbine or the dandelions is going to win out at the end. And so this is an example in an in a experiment where there were over 50 colonies that were labeled, grow them out over time, you end up with dominance. And on one hand, these, these cells outcompeted everything else in the room, but on the other hand, it might have just been the dandelions and the, and the dragon tongue vines or other things that you don't want. And the, the columbine and the azaleas and the other cells may be back here and you missed the opportunity because you didn't control the environment. And so we've been working on this concept of taking that mix of cells, understanding what's there, and then developing tools to be able to 
isolate individual parts of it or remove individual parts to be able to better control the outcome. So it's a logical strategy. It just takes a lot of work to ask the question of, well, is this gonna help or not? And can we control it? So the idea is here to take cells that might be a mix of cells, but if you grow them over time, they start to disclose something about their differences, as you saw in that original dish. And then I could choose, based on those differences, to either biopsy some things and do some tests on it, to pick up certain things and move them and isolate them, or just eliminate everything I don't think I want. So that picking, weeding, biopsy are useful strategies. And so we focused on that part of this. And what we needed was either a really, really good technician who didn't drink coffee and had a perfectly reliable hand and would show up for work every day, even on Saturdays and Sundays, or we needed a robot that would do that. And so what we have set out about is the task of designing a, and this is, I'm welcoming you into, the, into my lab, a system that looks like this for right now. And inside of that system, you'll see a robot that is able to collect images of cells, work in micron level precision, and pick up and move and biopsy things. And then there's a workspace at a, another six axis robot here that'll move cells from an inbox to an outbox to an incubator. And I'll show you some other pictures of that, but I don't want to dwell on it. But there's ways in which you can do better than a human hand. And you can also be more repeatable, but you could also document much, much better. So rather than relying on a Tom or a Linda or a Harry or a Sue who's outstanding and they really know what they're doing, I want to use their expertise to design a way to recreate what they can do using a system that operates on the cells and in this case uses a system that will move plates around so they don't ever have to touch the plates. And now this robot will work, do what I want, document what we want, and it also work more than eight hours a day. It doesn't take breaks for pregnancy. I don't have to fire Linda. She can work from home and monitor what this does, right? So it's a way to, to make our expertise and our knowledge pay off, but also get the things that the human body isn't really designed to do perfectly well into another, into another state. And so this is one of the things that you can do, for example, this is a bunch of colonies that came from different sources. I want to know about that colony, and I want to know whether or not that colony came from a single cell. Well, if I've captured this image, I can't tell. But if I go back in time by going here, I can play this video back. I've been collecting this image all along. I can know what that one, that that came from a single founding cell, and I know the attributes of that cell. So now I get documentation of provenance all the way back to the beginning. And so we're trying to use that. I can't say that it's useful yet, but it's the kind of tool that we think is going to be necessary to allow the world to move forward. Um, so many of you know Jamie Thompson and the story about um, embryonic stem cells. So this was a huge breakthrough in 1998 and where he showed that in humans as well as in monkeys first, that in an early embryo, there are cells that can do anything if you just isolate them and grow them in a proper way. The good news is that they'll make anything. The bad news is that you have to destroy an embryo in order to get them. So this was that dilemma in the, during the Bush administration of what are we gonna do with this? That dilemma was largely solved by Dr. Yamanaka, who in 2007 showed that it was possible to make induced pluripotent cells that were every bit as good or as, as close as possible as you can imagine to an embryonic stem cell and by taking cells from any of us, exposing them to factors that are present in the human egg, but then making what is like an embryonic stem cell that can grow into any different lineage, can't grow into a whole human being, but it can grow into heart cells, liver cells, lung cells, kidney cells, bone cells. Um, and it can come from any one of us. So we don't have to borrow cells from somebody else. We can make cells that are an exact match for us. So he not only shared the Nobel Prize in 2012, but then opened up this entire field here of a personalized cellular therapy for tissue replacement and also personalized testing so that drugs didn't have to be tested on animals all the time. Humans across a whole diversity of humans ethnicities, ages, could be 
placed in a dish with known environment, and then tested against a variety of drugs to test. So this has huge implications in cardiology, for example, because there are some drugs that will save people's lives and other drugs that will kill people if you give them to people with exactly the same problem. Um, so what we learned is we were making that robot to grow out the Zygomal stromal cells, but it turns out IPS cell biology is, it happened to be a puck landing at exactly the same place where we were skating. And that is that in order to do IPS cells well, you have to reprogram them and follow these plaques of cells that came from a single cell. You have to compare the quality of those plaques that form because not all of them are healthy. You have to choose to get rid of cells that are competing with them, in this case fibroblasts, so that they can continue to grow. You have to look for cells that aren't performing well over time as you grow these cells out. You have to be able to transfer them from one plate to another, monitor how well they're growing over time, and then find areas of mutations that are a problem in the population, and then ultimately, you know, I'm sorry my head's probably in the way for some of you, but in this case, get to organoids which are of specialized differentiated cell type, and I'll tell you more about that. Those are photoreceptor cells for treating blindness. So, what we're trying to do, and I'm not the only one, there's a whole group called Catapult in the UK and a place called Stem Cell Factory in, in, in the EU that are trying to work on this challenge of taking this laborious, difficult, but highly technical and highly skill-oriented manual process, making it much, much more repeatable and reliable, adding documentation, which is currently absent from much of the field, and reducing the cost and risk and labor demands that are necessary in order to facilitate the acceleration of this kind of space. So my first wonderful collaborator in the IPS world, because I'm not an IPS biologist by training, is this guy Bud Tucker, who is at the University of Iowa, which is one of the biggest and, and most renowned places for treating inherited diseases of the eye. There are 40,000 kids that are born every year uh, just in the United States, who have a rhodopsin mutation. So rhodopsin is the protein in your eye that detects light. And so, so children that are born with a rhodopsin mutation can see for a while, but then as their fetal rhodopsin goes away, by the time they're five, they can't see at all. They can't even know if they're in a light room or a dark room. Dark room. And so Bud is interested in treating that because now it's unique. There's one cell in a very specific location. It just has to, one gene has to be changed. And what he'd like to do is first make cells from those children using IPS cells that are neural progenitors, place them into a wafer here that's only about 100 microns thick where they're, they're, uh, they're oriented properly, slip them into the back of the eye and the rest of the kid's eyes are normal. So signals will connect and signals will go all the way back to the posterior occiput in the brain, and he's shown that it works in rats, it works in, in uh, dogs, and so now there's a first in human clinical trial ongoing, the first 10 children that have blindness that are going to be treated with these cells using this method, and this is, you can see one of these implants, this is actually a dog, but not a child, but one of these implants placed in a strategic part of the eye where, where the children would be able to perhaps detect light. So what we had to do is take Bud's complicated process, which I won't go through, and expand this out. This is the process of making induced pluripotent cells. This is the process of making those photoreceptor cells that detect light that he will then transplant. But what we use our system for is to pick cells, to monitor and track, to do weeding, to do selection, and to make this process so that in the next trial, it doesn't have to be people's hands using it, because he can do 10 children, but he can't do 100 children or 1,000 children by hand. There's just not enough expertise in his lab and time and, and energy, so it has to be automated to bring it to. So this is the first paper we wrote, just came out last year, showing that we can use this device to make IPS cells, that they look healthy, they have normal chromosomes, they express the right genes, they, the organoids are oriented just like a developing eye. And uh, so what Bud and others want to do is to take this process where they look at this dish and they're making value judgments and they want to weed it. They want it to go from here to here without taking four hours of a technician's time. 
and they want to allow that cell, those cells to grow from here to here and then look at that colony and then have a history of what that colony came from back to here and even back to here. So they know the provenance of these cells. It's not unlike the systems that are coming into farming. Now, I don't know how many of you are farmers or in agriculture, but, but drones and farming and this kind of process of taking a, a large image of the land that you're managing and sending a drone out and then using certain wavelengths to measure dryness in the soil and choose where you do irrigation or measure aspects of crop health, which you can detect by the color and the density of color in the leaves to look for pests and add fertilizer and then even automate the process of something to go in and run. It's exactly the same. It's just four orders of magnitude of, of, of different, different scale, actually six orders of magnitude of scale that we're talking about. Oops, I just, uh, there we go. Um, so these are farmers' resources, these are our resources, and the process, and I'll go even faster now, of looking at those dishes, looking at these individual objects, measuring them, finding out attributes, and then taking an image that a technician would look at today and make their own decisions about automating it so that computer can look at that image and then start to selectively remove things that are not of interest until you decide on what it is you're gonna invest in. And uh, so I already showed you that slide. So the system you know, is now only in a few laboratories in the world. My lab was the first, but one in California, one in Iowa, and uh, soon in a few other places. Um, it is focused on quality control, it's focused on automation, uh, is focused on capturing the data and the knowledge that's, that's necessary and in a way that's entirely agnostic. I don't care if somebody's trying to make a photoreceptor cell or a lung cell to, to treat cystic fibrosis or a dopaminergic neuron to treat Parkinson's disease. The same processes work. These cells still grow in two dimensions and if, if, and if an expert can tell us what to look for and what they want to pick or weed or biopsy, this is a system that can give them control over things one at a time. Yeah, so time. I'm gonna run through this. This is just about data. These are my last five slides, I think. So I was gonna tell you, what's the status of clinical trials today? Um, so uh, this is a slide that just I saw just yesterday. It's actually close to 1,000 clinical trials. I think this number is uh, 500 is wrong, but in 2013, mesenchymal uh, stromal cells were involved in about 76 trials. There's, I think, over 1,000 trials now. And it's not true that there were no FDA-approved trials. Well, there are, it is true that there are no FDA-approved trials, but there are some approved drugs in other countries. I'll show you those. Most of these trials, most of the subjects, and it's now still less than 100,000 people, but 18,000 in China, 15,000 in the US that have been part of these studies. <coughs> um, about half of all the trials involve the musculoskeletal system, neurology, COVID and lung disease are a huge explosion during COVID. Um, and immunomodulation, and, uh, and um, I think uh, we'll, I'll, well, we'll go too into too deep into that. There are things that you can use these cells for today. In the United States, there's one approved uh, therapy for graft versus host disease. It's made by a company called Mesoblast. In the U EU, there are two drugs. In Australia, there's another one. Uh, in Japan, there's another one that use, that use for graft versus host disease. I won't go into that, but it's, it's a, it's a life-threatening problem that people who've had a bone marrow transplantation can get involved in or can be threatened by. In India, there's a limb ischemia approval. In Iran, there's an osteoarthritis approval. What's really odd about this is that there's one type of cell that's used for all of these things, which just doesn't quite make sense, does it? And so there, it, there may be benefits in some people, and, and so the world is still at a phase, and if I had a, if I, I took out a slide on Vincent Van Gogh and, and his history and digoxin, then that would be related to this. CAR T cells, you may have heard of CAR T cells. I don't know if ever, any of you have had friends or family member who've had malignant, um, tumors of the blood system and lymphomas and leukemias that are now being treated by five drugs that have made it into this inner circle that are approved for treatment of specialized um, uh, lymphoid tumors. But there's a lot of drugs out here in the phase one, phase two, phase three trial domain 
from a variety of sources that are, that are coming, to, coming to play. Good news too for gene therapy. There was the very first uh, product that was available. There's a gene therapy engineered um, cell not an IPS drive cell, but an engineered cell that was approved just in the, at the end of, uh, of 2023 for treating sickle cell disease. So this is a fix the gene, give the kids a transplant of their own cells. Uh, but there's also challenges. So this is another very recent paper that said, well, if you grow cell, IPS cells and you keep them growing for very long, they start to accumulate mutations, they start to accumulate risk, they start to accumulate problems that may add risk to your product, to the, your patients. And so we've got work to do to limit the risk or detect that early. But there is all of these applications for IPS cells. <clears throat> there are all of these risks for, these, for IPS cells we have to sort through. Um, if you're interested in getting wonky with me, this is a paper that just came out two weeks ago. I'm a co-author. Uh, that came out of the International Society for Cell and, and Gene Therapy on the future of IPS cells and what needs to be done next. And, uh, but it's gonna be exciting, it's gonna be rewarding. Storm's not over yet. Um, but uh, uh, with a little precision and a little diligence, I think we will get there. And so I'm gonna get credit for all of those things and turn it over to Johnny to bring us home. So thank you, I think I went over time, so I apologize for that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I'm having a problem with this thing on my ear. <laughs> so um, what I'm gonna try to do is to try to take it from what George told you and now what can we do today with this technology and, and this thing is happening in this valley here. You will see what we built you know, in Vail, Colorado and, and the goal is can we improve the benefit of stem cell for patients and can we do a stem cell banking? And I'm gonna talk about LT aging. Nobody wants to age, so the goal is to age better. So again, like George said, you know, a lot of this work is funded by the NIH, the Department of Defense, but also, you know, you see a lot of people, you know, in the bottom of this slide here. Some of them are here in the room. We have Borgen, uh, Bjorn Borgen with us today, but has been supporting us, you know, for many, many years, Mike Shannon and Stephen Reed. And <clears throat> I just would like to say that this is very important because it supports the research, you know, when it gets started. And now you will see that we're doing clinical trials. First, I, you know, for you, I have to say a word about Dr. Stedman. He was an icon in this place. Um, George Gillette, you know, who's sitting here, you know, was brought, you know, Dr. Stedman here in, in mid-90s and, and mid-80s, and he passed away last year. So he was really, a, you know, an icon in the field and a visionary, and I'm so proud to be here in, in Vail, Colorado, to follow his, his, you know, his leadership that he has been built here for many years. So our team, so this is our team, so I'm not gonna go through the details, but we built a team of you know, over 65 people now who do research in this valley. So all of those people here in this slide, you know, again, and you can see you know, Mark Philippon, who is it, uh, at the middle of it, and Dan Draba is our CEO, and I'm the chief scientific officer, and all those people here are doing part of this you know, journey to bring the stem cells to the patient and I'm very proud of this team. But the team, the research team, is surrounded by surgeon. And the surgeon, you know, um, sometimes I call them our cheerleader because the surgeon are talking to the patient and bring the patient to those clinical trials. So the surgeon are key for this work that we're doing. And all the people here, all those fellows that come from Norway, that come from China, Japan, they are the glue between us because they spend time in research in the lab and they go in surgery with the surgeon. So they are kind of the bridge between us. Um, and I'm very proud of building the system here. It works very well and uh, I'm so proud of it. So what do we do? So the goal is to try to improve outcome. And how do we do this? Of course, you know, I'm trying to develop new drugs, new treatment to try to improve your healing process after an ECL reconstruction, after a rotator cuff repair. But we have a team of people that do imaging and MRI because this is very important to visualize what you're going through, bowel motion, 
Now we're putting sensor on you, you know, we don't have enough to ask you if DCL is working well. We can see clearly from the computer. And the goal is to try to bring you, you know, to a level that you're not gonna have pain anymore. Robotics, it's amazing because we teach new surgeon how to do an ECL reconstruction in, with the robot. So the robot is teaching them, you know, and helping them. The biomechanics is very important. And the clinical outcome, this is Dr. Stedman. When he started in mid-80s, he said, I'm gonna collect the patient report, the patientreporter.com for a long time. And that's very important because now we have a database that is one of the biggest in the country. We have been following patients. And it's important to follow patients because your surgery may work today, may work in a year from now, but in 10 years may not work as well. So that's very important. So I'm going to talk about regenerative medicine. I've been doing this for a long time. I was in Pittsburgh, you know, for many years, and now I move here. And the goal is to really try to, to develop new therapies. You know, because sometimes as scientists, we have to go outside of the path, because if we're all going in the same path, we're never going to find any cure for cancer, because we have to think outside of the box. And the best thing I've seen on coming to Colorado is, you know, is if you want to think outside of the box, come to Colorado because you think outside, period. Because everybody's on the mountain, people are skiing. And I really believe the high altitude has something to do with this thinking outside of the box. <laughs> so here is the regenerative medicine team that we built. And this thing here is very amazing because this is a lot of those people here are the future doctor that you're going to see. Here is the son of Mark Philippon. Here is the son of a very, very famous surgeon, you know, uh, from Harvard, a joint replacement doctor. Here's my son, Charles, who is doing, you know, his, his bachelor and PhD in Texas A&M. Here's my older son. So those people come here, we are a stepping stone for them. They come here, they train with us, and after this, they go out in the world and they basically, you know, do what we teach them what to do. So what do we do? Again, I'm not gonna go in details. We have four buckets of research in regenerative medicine. We have the stem cells bucket, we have the regenerative medicine uh, approach bucket, and there we're doing gene therapy, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, a lot of things that we're doing to modify the gene, like George talked about. Therapeutics, uh, we're using FDA-approved drug as an off-label, and I'm gonna give you an example today about a drug called COSAR, it's a blood pressure medication that now we're giving to all our patients to prevent scarring in their knee after surgery. And of course, everything has to be tested in animal models. So we have an animal facility, one of the best in the country in Fort Collins, Colorado State University. We can do mice, rat, rabbit, but horse, sheep, and goat. And, and that is very important to do large animal models sometime for, before going to human. So I'm just gonna talk to you about one thing, is orthobiologics. You may have heard, sometimes you have pain in your knee, but you don't want a knee replacement. So you go and see the doctor and said, hey, can I get a platelet-rich plasma, right? We take your blood, we concentrate your platelet, we inject this into your knee, your shoulder, your elbow. The goal there is to slow down the pain. The goal is to basically make you wait a little bit longer. We also do bone marrow aspirate. We drill a hole in your iliac crest here. We harvest the stem cells. We inject this into your shoulder, into your knee and your head. So the goal here is to buy time, because if you have to have a, a joint replacement at 50, you're gonna need another one at 75, because they last 25 years. So if, we do, if you are at 50 and we try to kill your pain, and now you get your first knee replacement at 65, then maybe that's gonna be the last one you're gonna have in your lifetime. So again, we were part, I was part of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery meeting, where they ask, you know, should we do this PRP and BMAC? Because the problem with PRP and BMAC, we can never tell you if it's gonna work or not. The only thing we can tell you is not gonna hurt you. But we never know if it's really gonna work. So what the American Academy said, let's develop clinical trials. Let's try to prove that this technology work. So this is exactly what we did. So I'm gonna give you an example. Here is the proof point biologic, you know, uh, clinic that we have here in Vail. So we inject PRP and BMAC every single day. By the way, we inject 3,000 biologic, you know, uh, injection last year alone. So a lot of people liked it. So the bottom line though is, you know, sometimes we never know if it works or not. So what we are doing is this. So on this side is the research program. And here, this is basically the biologics of the future, the iPhone 19 of medicine, okay? So the iPhone 15 works, but the iPhone 19 will be a little bit better, right? So that's really, here, this is not ready for prime time. 
But when a drug or a stem cell do very well in the animal model, very promising, what we do next is clinical trials. Those clinical trials here, you have a placebo group. So you never know if you're going to fall in the real group or the placebo group. That's the reason why we don't invite our friend and family in clinical trials, because nobody wants to fall in the placebo group, right? But anyway, so I think this thing is very important. And just one of these trials here, you know, uh, this one here, it's a $6 million clinical trial. It takes five years to complete. That takes a long time, but you have to do it to really prove it. So we have a lot of people, you know, in this valley on those clinical trials already. So we have, like, you can see six or seven of them. But, you know, I think, you know, this is really the goal here is to try to delay the first knee or hip and shoulder replacement. But now let me talk to you about aging, because aging fits very well into this, because I'm going to tell you that we all age one day at a time. Nobody wants to age. But if there is something fair in life, is we all age. But the bottom line is, you know, we think, a lot of us think that we can delay aging. Not reverse it, but delay it. My goal is to make you age healthier and better. And how are we going to do this? Diet and lifestyle. If you're drinking too many beers, you smoke cigars, and you, know, you never work out, I'm not going to find a drug that's going to work on you. So you have to work with me so the drug work on you. The third thing that we do here, personalized medicine. I'm looking at all your blood. I'm looking at your biomarkers. Now we have biomarkers for prostate cancer, PSA. We have biomarker for breast cancer. We have biomarker for Alzheimer. But now I'm looking at all the biomarkers, and the goal is to try to personalize the treatment for you. And this is what we're trying to do. And here is a regenerative medicine where we do the stem cell banking, stem cell transplantation. And here is the drugs and the supplements. You know, I become, we become one of the best bartenders in the valley because we make cocktails <laughs> of pills. And I'm telling you, some of them are pretty good. And, and again, but again, again, everything here has to be discovered in the lab, tested in animal model, and now moving to human. And I'm going to show you that we're already there in human. The idea is to die young as late as possible. Try to remember that from my talk. That's what I'm trying to achieve. My goal is you drop dead the day after you ski all day. My goal is you drop dead after you run your five-mile run. So that's really important because what's the point to live longer if, you don't, if you're not active? So this is what we're trying to do, but everybody is different. So here, here you have the diet, regenerative medicine, lifestyle, and drug and supplement. But for some patients, they may have to control their diet more. They may have to work out more. They need, uh, and they may need less drug. For other patients, they work out all the time. They, they eat very well. What they need is probably some help with the drugs and supplement. So, Everybody is different. So my goal is to try to personalize this for you. So how are we going to do this? LT aging is not an easy thing. So if you think that I'm going to find a drug that's going to delay aging and bring you back to 25, that's not going to work. However, we have a lot of drugs here that we're testing with the best of the best in the country. And I'm going to talk about one thing that George touched upon here is senescent cells, those bad cells, those zombie cells that everybody talks about. And let me just, you know, start by talking about, and I'm going to talk about the stem cell banking, because stem cell banking is something that you can do today to help you tomorrow as well, but we have to do it right. So first, uh, I'm just going to talk about osteoarthritis. I'm going to use one disease. I can use Alzheimer, Parkinson. Um, I can use a lot of different diseases. But I'm going to use one, osteoarthritis, because no matter what, how old you become, you're going to develop, you're going to become bone on bone. If you're active enough, I run five miles a day, I know I'm going to need a knee or hip replacement. The thing I don't know is when. And I'm trying to push it as long as possible. So your joint, your stem cells in your joint, you know, can stop preparing your cartilage, and now you end up bone on bone, and you need a knee replacement or hip replacement. OK? But the problem that you have to understand is you don't go and see a doctor like Ray Kim, which is one of the best knees, uh, you know, joint replacement here. You don't want to see Ray Kim and say, hey, I need a joint replacement today because I saw in my MRI that I don't have cartilage in my knee. You go and see Ray Kim because you have pain. Pain is the driver here. Pain is driving you. So now we're trying to develop drug that with less side effect that will reduce your pain. Because if I can reduce your pain, 
Maybe you can delay your joint replacement for five years. You don't have pain in your knee anymore. So I'm going to give you an example. Dr. Stedman came here, visionary, and he developed a technique called the macrofractures. He goes in your knee joint, and he drill hole in your cartilage. And he lets cells from your bone marrow to come in your joint and repair your cartilage. And I'm going to show you that this technique worked. And when I come with Dr. Stedman in 2015, I had a dinner with him, and I said, Dr. Sedman, I think I can improve your surgery by adding drugs to your treatment. And he was excited about this, and it's one of the reasons why I came here. But here is really what he did. So now he developed this technique. And the, the cartilage that you're making when you drill a hole is not good cartilage. It's bad cartilage. We call this fibrocartilage. So what we did here, we basically did an animal study where we said, hey, now we're going to put this, the, those animals on a drug called Cozar to block fibrosis. Now, when you, put the fibro when you block fibrosis, you can see this bar here, you improve cartilage repair in a rabbit, and it works very well. So what we did, we started clinical trials where we have patients on the placebo, patients on the losartan, same surgery, and the question was asked, you know, now we're finishing those studies, can you heal better now when we put you this drug, you know, this is COSAR, this is 25 milligram per day for 30 days after surgery? You may ask, is it working? Well, here is Mark Philippon. He's doing hip atroscopy all the time, right? When I came in 2015, he started to use COSAR because I told him, I said, maybe you should try. So now he started to use COSAR after his surgery, and now he cut his revision case by 50%. Think about it. When the patient doesn't come back to see you, you did a good job. <laughs> you know, in our world, this is the way we measure our successes. If you don't come back to see us, so that means we did a pretty good job. So what he found is 50% of his patients, after giving them a drug to block fibrosis, now they don't come back because they feel better. Just adding a drug. So this is really you know, what I think about. Um, now, is Losartan good for other joint? Now, Peter Millet you know, is doing rotator cuff all the time. He said, hey, how about if I start to use this drug too? Now we're testing this, and I'm going to show you a, a studies on the sheep you know, very soon here. But we show that if you give Losartan, you can improve shoulder repair as well. If you use Losartan, you can improve ankle repair as well. And what Rekim is doing right now is, if you do a knee replacement, you know, maybe 20% of you is going to come back because your knee gets get stiff. You cannot move it anymore. This is all fibrosis. So now, Rekim is putting his patient on COSAR again to try to block fibrosis, to try to improve the outcome after joint replacement. This is what I call regenerative medicine. We're not trying to replace a surgeon here. We're trying to improve the outcome. And this is what's happening. So now, the shock cancer center, Dr. Ardenberg came to see me and said, you know what, the biggest problem with breast cancer, Johnny, she said, when I do breast cancer, I cure the patient, but now they have fibrosis in their lung. They have fibrosis where, you know, we put the breast implant. And this is the biggest problem because you're cured from cancer, but you have lung fibrosis now. She said, I would like to use this drug. So now we're starting a clinical trials with her. And again, we have a NIH grant that has been recently scored. But again, just to show, show you that the same drug can be used for different applications. And that is very important, you know, for cancer patients now. Not to cure cancer, to prevent fibrosis after the radiation induced fibrosis. So now let me tell you about those senescent cells. Those cells. You know, I'm French-Canadian, so the way I pronounce senescent, some people ask me, you know, what, what do you say? I said, now I call them zombie cells. What I mean by zombie cells, they don't die. They stay with you. Those cells, you know, like George said, you know, you build your, your skin, and after this, your skin goes down, and other cells, you know, build your skin. Those cells, for some reason, they stop. They stay stuck in our body. So in other words, you may have cells in your body today that are 50-year-old. They stay stuck with you. And you know what they do? They secrete inflammatory mediators. They drive inflammation. They drive pain. Those cells have been linked with cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, osteoarthritis. Those cells is going to get probably a Nobel Prize very soon. Not from us, from the field. And you know why it's fun about those cells? Is now we find drugs and natural supplements. They are plant derivative that can kill those bad cells. 
So this is why we get excited about this. We said, well, wow, this thing can be a real treatment now, maybe for osteoarthritis, but, but also for neurodegeneration and cancer. So what we did here is the following. So we wanted to prove that those cells are linked to osteoarthritis. The first thing, our, uh, our co-worker from Mayo Clinic, they took senescent cells and they inject this to a knee joint of a mice. They develop osteoarthritis. These mice develop osteoarthritis even if they are very young. So that showed that those cells are linked to osteoarthritis. Us, we did the opposite. We took mice that develop osteoarthritis and now we, we treat them, we put in their drinking water. The mice doesn't know which one is getting the which, so we don't have to deal with placebo here. But the bottom line, we found that the mice that get the drug, you can see here, their cartilage remain almost normal here. But the mice that didn't get the drug, they have a lot of destruction in their cartilage. So because of those studies, now we're doing a clinical trials. This is the second one here, where we have patients with OA. Some of them are taking the physetin, which is a natural supplement to reduce senescent cells. The other group take the placebo. And now we're following them. I don't know who take the placebo. The patient doesn't know who take the placebo. The surgeon doesn't know who take the placebo. The only person who knows who take the placebo is a pharmacist. And the pharmacist can call directly the FDA. This is why you see sometimes trials are starting, they shut down. It's because the FDA, you know, are involved with, with following the results. So right now, we haven't had any clinical trials that has been terminated, but I can tell you that now we are analyzing the result. But one question I asked, I said, hey, if we start to treat patients with osteoarthritis, I give them a natural supplement, and I try to reduce OA, maybe I'm not going to see any change in their knee joint within a year. I said, we need to develop a test to be able to detect senescent cells in their blood. At least I know when I gave you Fizetin, if I reduce senescent cells in your blood, then I know the drug works. Maybe your knee is not going to change, but at least your senescent cell will decrease. So we develop a test. This thing took us five years. A lot of research dollar from, you know, Mr. Borgen and his family here, you know, this thing, just one test is $1,000. We did 500 tests multiple times. But here is the result. So we have over 400 patients, you know, from the valley that came to be tested. And now what we know is the following. Older you get, more senescent cells you have. That's, you know, the rule of aging, I guess. But if you take this Fizetin one pill a day, you can reduce your senescent cells in your blood within 30 days. Not only you reduce your senescent cell, but you reduce those factors that those senescent cells release. So clearly, you know, this is really something that we're very excited about. So now, this Fizetin, again, I'm not holding stock in any Fizetin pharmaceutical, you know, I'm totally, you know, <laughs> away from conflict of interest. But this thing seems to work, and again, can reduce, you know, senescent cells. This is, you know, we have shown that elevating, uh, elevating cellular senescence was confirmed in patients with osteoarthritis, and if you take the analytics, you can reduce your senescent cells. Now, this thing is very important for us, because now we're doing more clinical trials. So this is a paper that we just published, you know, and uh, I just would like to uh, finish here by, by saying that senescent cells are not only involved with osteoarthritis, they are also involved with neurological disease. Here is paper showing that senescent cells accumulate in your brain when you have Alzheimer and Parkinson, and if you clear those senescent cells, you may have a, a treatment for Alzheimer. Senescent cells accumulate in patients with concussion. How many people get concussion with our uh, beloved you know, football you know, in America? And, and again, you know, I mean, we have no treatment for that. And a lot of people suffer from this. So we think that senescent cells you know, will increase in your blood when you have you know, uh, uh, injuries, but also if we treat with treatment, we can reduce senescent cells and maybe alleviate the symptoms. Here's a very interesting study. This is a study that we start with, you know, with the funding on Mr. Borgen here. And Mr. Borgen, you know, funded this study. And because we did the study on 12 sheep, he asked us to call the 12 sheep with a Norwegian name. So we all have a name for them here. And we have one that, you know, his name is, you know, Eric Borgen. <laughs> But again, I mean, the goal, the science can be fun too, right? I mean, so the goal of this study was, it, can we improve rotator cuff repair? But my son, you know, who's working in the brain and Alzheimer's said, Dad, we treat those animals with physetin. Do we know if physetin goes in the brain? Because we have a blood-brain barrier. You, you know that, right? 
I said, I don't know. So my son said, hey, how about if I look in the brain of those sheep now? And those sheep were probably like 65, 70 year old human being. They are like seven year old sheep. And what, what we found in this study is that, yes, you have senescent cells in your brain, but if you take physetin, you can reduce the number of senescent cells in your brain. So that was very interesting, and why it's so important, because you all have heard about the behavioral health uh, building that they just built, you know, uh, not too far from here, in Edwards, where they want to do a mental health program. It turns out that, you know, uh, major depression is also linked with inflammation and senescent cells. And we think that those treatments can be used, you know, and Japanese researchers show that Fizetin alleviated depression now. So now we're working with Dr. Charles Reason from Wisconsin and Chris Lindley and Will Cook to try to build something for people with depression as well. So I'm almost done here. I just want to say that, you know, I, I want to finish, but I cannot speak faster than I am. But let me just finish with this. My friend George didn't help me here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So here, you know, we just, I just want to tell you stem cell therapy. The problem with stem cell therapy right now is we can inject stem cell to you. We inject the best stem cell to you. But what we decided to do us is to try to see, can we optimize the patient? Is it possible that today, before you get the stem cell treatment, then you're going to come in one month before we're going to reduce your inflammation when we inject the stem cells, and after this, we're going to reduce scarring by using drugs and medication. So this is a trial that has been funded by the NIH for $6 million, where the goal is not to improve the stem cells. The goal is to improve the patient before stem cell treatment. And again, we're all different, and drinking, stopping drinking water you know, before your surgery and not smoking and not drinking the night before, maybe we need to start a month before your surgery and do this. So I just would like to say, but now what we would like to do is when you're sleeping and having your rotator cuff repair, what if we go in, we harvest your stem cells, we bank it while you're sleeping, so now when you leave the clinic, your stem cell can be banked. So now, the goal is stem cell banking is great, the technology is good, the problem with this is the way we're doing it is wrong. And, and why it's wrong? Because people have this notion that you need billions of stem cells to repair your knee or to repair your hip. Think about it. If those stem cells are so good, why do you need billions of them? So now we decide to, we found that when you grow stem cells, when you grow them, you expand them, you know what happened in those flasks, in those culture dishes? You, be, you, you start to see zombie cells because those cells become senescent cells. So now we have shown this very clearly here that you know, when you grow stem cells here, you can see that the number of senescent cells increase. So now when I saw this and I know that senescent, that I know expanding stem cells is not good, I said, is there a possibility to do a stem cell transplantation without growing millions of cells. And I came across this technology here that they are using all the time. If you have leukemia, what they're gonna do, they, do, they harvest your, your blood, they take your hematopoietic stem cells, they freeze it, they do a full body radiation, and after this, they inject the stem cell that they have harvested a month ago. You know what they don't do? They don't grow them. So if they don't grow them to, to heal leukemia patients, why do we need to grow them to, to heal your ECL in your knee? So now, we just got a grant from the, sta uh, the state of Colorado for stem cell banking, where we think that when we drill your whole iliac crest to get your bone marrow, so now what we do, we take nine ml of bone marrow, nine ml of bone marrow, we inject everything into your shoulder. But what I did is I said, when they do the leukemia treatment, how many stem cells do they inject? They inject. And I found that they inject a fraction of the stem cells that we have in our bone marrow. So I believe that you know, one way will be to harvest your bone marrow, inject half in your shoulder, the other half I'm going to freeze it down. I'm not going to grow them, I'm going to freeze it down. And our goal is we're going to cut expansion, we're going to be FDA approved, and we're going to also cut, you know, the cost of this, because the cost of stem cell banking right now is you have to fly to Mexico, you have to fly to Germany. You should ask yourself, why, why do I have to fly to Germany and Mexico? It's because, you know, it's not FDA approved. Us, we're going to do it right here in this valley, and that's going to be FDA approved. The final thing I want to say here is we found over the years, and George will agree with this, we, we inject stem cells into the heart, into a bone fracture, into a cartilage damage. We can improve cartilage repair, cardiac repair, and bone repair. But if you ask, how many stem cells that I've injected has become bone cells, has become cardiac cells? 
we found none, very few of them. So we found that the stem cells are very clever because the stem cells are releasing those small vesicles here. And those vesicles are called exosomes. And the exosome here contain all the goodies, all the factors to improve tissue repair, to reduce fibrosis, to improve angiogenesis. So now we ask the question, can we inject just the exosome now? We don't need the stem cells. And maybe if we, if we do the exosome, we're going to be more efficient, so we don't need the stem cells, we just need what the stem cells secrete. So we just started you know, a program here in Vail about you know, uh, using exosome therapeutics as a treatment for OA for osteoarthritis. Now, you know, I think you know, exosome has good stuff and bad stuff in it too, so we're doing some analysis and we think that senolytic and antifibrotic agent can improve exosome therapeutics. And finally, you know, my belief is, you know, recently we just got an award for this work that we're doing. So exosome is not free of problem, but it's a step further. And if I take stem cell from me and inject to you, you're going to reject my stem cells. But if I take stem cell from me, get the exosome, get rid of the stem cells, and inject the exosome to you, maybe you're not going to reject the exosome. And that's why we can take a bank of young cells down the road. So here I'm done orthobiologics in 2024. You can talk about PRP, you can talk about bone marrow, you can talk about you know, exosome, adipose stem cells, but I think what I believe is to really apply this in clinic, you need to combine this with drugs and supplements to improve the patient. Because at the end of the day, we need to just improve you to make sure that when you get the stem cell therapy, the result we're going to get is the result that we want. But they, again, this is something that we're doing right here in Vail, Colorado, and I'm very proud of this, and I think I was done anyway. So thank you very much. <laughs> Can I just say something? The last slide was a, a thank you note for my wife who's sitting here and my two sons that work in science with us too. So that was my thank you slide, but I was not able to present it. Sorry. <laughs> So my question is for Dr. Mulcher. Dr. Mulcher, how do you see robotics and AI combining? You, you have the robot now picking the right cells. Can AI help them harvest that better? So the, way I, the way I envision this and, and is that there, there's a multi-step process. So in, in Bud Tucker's at Iowa, it's 172 days from the time he does the reprogramming step makes IPS cells, and then runs them down the differentiation process to a photoreceptor cell. He fails three out of four times, but it takes him 172 days to recognize the failure. And in that time, there was a behavior and a, a, a appearance and attributes of cells at each step along the way. What do they look like? And there are ways of measuring quantitatively the, the, the texture, the granularity, other attributes of cells. There were biopsies that could be taken along the way to look at gene expression. So throughout that 172 days, there could be measures of performance, knowledge of whatever's done to those cells, what media, what concentration, and all of the variables that go into this. And um, and so in the process of getting to a successful end, run, end, end result, and then looking at those unsuccessful end results, you can learn where you, where, where's the safe path, where's the road that leads you to an end result that's desirable, and how early in that process can you detect when you're off the road. You don't have to drive all the way to 172 days, perhaps, but you have to have all that data going back in time captured reliably, reproducibly in the same way without all the noise that happens when individuals make subjective decisions or somebody goes on vacation or, or you know, a, a student does the work instead of the, of the more skilled technician. If it's the same way every time and then there's variation, now the variation means something and you can capture that data. And it is a huge amount of data. It's not just big data, it requires um, assembling data. Yeah, it, Johnny and I will periodically use a method called single cell RNA-seq, where you, you, you measure, say, a group of 100,000 cells, and you're measuring 18,000 genes for each one of those 100,000 cells. It's a huge, huge data set. None of us can 
think about that at one time, but I could do that analysis six times in the process of making Bud's end result. And, and only with the assistance of AI could we start to dissect what dimension in that data starts to show us when we're on track or off track or where we need to intervene to move things in the right direction. I hope that gets it kind of the, kind of the right direction. But you can imagine, you know, the analysis, the, 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 the process of getting to the moon. It's a huge number of variables that go into it. And there are successes and failures and or driving from, from Vail to New York, there are successes and failures and, and uh, big data is already being used to guide ways and tell us when we're on track and when we're off track. Same kind of thing will happen if we have enough data and experience and consistency in the data we collect uh, when, we're, when we're doing these kind of tasks. Okay, we've got a double header in the back here. Hello, this is George Gillette at the back. A selfish question, doctors. Uh, when we were hearing you both talk, and you're brilliant, uh, we heard some numbers as to people that are affected by and or positively and or negatively by some of the diseases and issues that you were talking about. 40,000 was one number, for example, and so forth, Dr. George, you, you were talking about working on a project. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is a selfish question. I have Alzheimer's. Are the projects that either of you are working on it have any applicability toward Alzheimer's, the replacement of certain brain cells and so forth and so on? Because it's fascinated that what you're doing seems to be to have reference to be able to be used in, in an Alzheimer's environment. Do you, either of you have any thoughts or ideas? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can just say that um, we, we know now, it's always the stage. You have to understand that, for example, if you take cancer, you can take cancer, you know, um, when it starts. You know, it's different than when you take cancer that when it's all metastasis and it's going all over your organ, right? I think with Alzheimer right now is, you know, we have ways. We, actually, we have patients that came to be treated. Uh, you know, uh, we measured our senescent cells, for example, and some of them are t uh, taking a cocktail of a lot of different pills, like 20 different pills. But some of them, you know, their cognitive decline, you know, they didn't come back, but the cognitive decline plateaued. And, and again, the, the problem with this, George, is, you know, they're taking metformin, which is a diabetic drug, rapamycin, an immunosuppressive agent, uh, metfor, uh, you know, uh, fisetin, and they're taking so many that the problem is we don't know which one is which. But I know there is something in that cocktail, though. So I think for me, you know, um, I lost my father from Alzheimer, um, you know, probably 10 years ago. And if he was still alive today, I will, I will put him on some of those cocktails to help him. But again, the goal here is to delay the disease progression. That's a big deal. Because if you delay the disease progression, um, you know, then you can maybe give us time to find cure, for example. But right now is, you know, the progression of the disease is very fast sometimes. So for me, I don't do stem cell, but I think that the drug we're using may uh, reduce inflammation in the brain and also, you know, delay neurological disease. But every patient is different. Some patients are more advanced than others and it's very difficult to gauge based on just that technique. Mm. And I, I, can, I can add something to that. I agree with everything that Johnny just said. That you know, Alzheimer's disease is, is a complicated disease in multiple dimensions. One is things we call Alzheimer's disease are probably not all the same disease. There are multiple ways and mechanisms or places in the brain where things can change that start to affect me memory and performance. And, and it can be very subtle. It can take a very long time to progress. And it's different onset in different people. Sometimes they're genetic associations, sometimes they're not. And so Alzheimer's disease is one of these diseases we don't know if there's a deficiency in a stem cell or a deficiency in a particular um, mechanism. And to Johnny's point, in the earliest stages, which might happen 10 or 15 years before it's ever evident, 
it's what's happening there where we would have the greatest opportunity to intervene. There are places where we're going to see cellular therapies happen soonest, I think, are in places where we know that there's a cell in a specific fa place that is deficient in some way, and we have the opportunity to replace that cell, and it's also not too many cells. So in Bud's case, he only has to put two million cells in. That's not a lot of cells. I can, I can, I can fit 30 million cells in, a, in a, about 100 microliters of, of fluid. Oh, I just would like to add something to this, because there is some stem cell therapy center around the United States that injects stem cells. Uh, they are autologous. I mean, I, I know a couple of those companies. They are your fat stem cells, and they re-inject them. Some of them do intranasal injection. And, and, but, but again, the, the, the result is very mixed. Because in some patients, you have some effect. In other patients, you don't. And I would, like to say, I would like to tell you what my dream is here. My dream would be to try to catch Alzheimer 10 years before it starts. I think now we would like to develop a program where we're going to look at all your biomarkers, all your, you know, your inflammation, all the things that we need to look in your blood, all your genetics, and put this in a cloud for you, and that's going to be your name on it. And the goal will be to take you and your family and go through this and try to predict by using artificial intelligence which one is you know, at risk for cancer. And why not starting to treat you today for cancer that you're going to develop tomorrow? I think there, you know, because the way we do medicine right now, we're reactive. You come and see a doctor, and you have pain in your bellies, and now you have a pancreatic cancer, and now it is, the pain is driving you to the doctor. What if now we try to analyze this before we do your full uh, genetics and, and proteomics background? We can do this now. And now we predict and we start to treat you today for the disease you're going to have tomorrow. I think this is really the future of medicine. I really believe that. But again, this is a comprehensive program. But I'm very excited about this. We're starting to do uh, you know, a lot of you know, genomics in our team here to try to go in that direction. And, and, and I, uh, I really believe that it's going to be very helpful for patients in the future. Not for today, maybe, but for in the future. And just to, to finish, two, two parts of that. One is uh, I agree with something that, that you just said about you know, Alzheimer's is not just one part of the brain. It's, it involves more than one part of the brain. So targeting it with a cell therapy, getting those cells to, even if you knew what cell to replace, getting them to go to the place that you wanted and stay in the place that you wanted, that's a lot of steps. But to the extent that Alzheimer's disease, like many other neurological diseases, it has an inflammatory component, and it's sped up or exacerbated by inflammation, there are ways to intervene both with cells and with drugs to reduce inflammation. But now you have to get involved in really understanding what type of Alzheimer's disease is it, and then doing those tests and clinical trials to decide is there an effect and is it enough to, to be worthwhile. But uh, in, in, the, in the brain, the next thing that will happen, I think, and you'll see a lot of clinical trials coming very soon is in is in Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson's disease in a very specific part of the brain, a very specific neurological cell where there is knowledge about how to make it, and it doesn't take 172 days to make. Um, and so injecting a small number of cells in exactly the right place in a person at an early enough stage in their disease may, may be transformative for Parkinson's disease. Uh, Bjorn Borgen, uh, Johnny's number one fan and, and <laughs> guinea pig. Uh, the experts are telling us that artificial intelligence is going to change our life going forward. But the most, the expert says the most significant area is going to be medical research. Are either one of you, have you, either one of you started to use artificial intelligence in your research? Or is that something you see in the future? And this is not a planted question, so he... <laughs> But, but I, if I can start, you know, I, I just want to say that we're starting to use it. We just recruited, you know, uh, the first, you know, PhD, you know, with us who do artificial learning and, and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and we're starting to do this. But let me get, I gave a talk this morning at the, uh, the, um, the behavioral health, mental health program. And do you know now that this is very 
exciting in medicine, you can build a digital twin. So nowadays, I mean, this is really, you know, I don't know if you heard about this, but so you can put all the biomarkers and all the thing, and you can create a digital person that is like you. And after this, in that digital person, you can test medication and you can see the prediction of that medication will do. This is, so now we are trying to develop a program that we're going to launch, launch for the army, is to develop the, the digital twins. So like this, we can use artificial intelli intelligence to guide how we're going to treat you. Again, I mean, many surgeons, before they do a surgery to a patient, it will be nice to know, uh, I mean, you know, who you're dealing with sometimes, because sometimes the patient that rolled in your surgery room, you don't know him, and, and you know what, I mean, is someone, you just check, you know, is that your name? And they said, yes, and you said, well, is that your date of birth? They said, yes, okay, roll him in a surgery room. Now think about it now that you have your, we have all your information in a cloud for you. And now we know all your biomarkers, we know all your, 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 your medical history. And while they roll you in the room, they said, oh, here is this guy. Okay, we need to be careful because this guy had cancer before. Okay, hey, we need to be careful because this guy is very sensitive to anesthesia. Those things can save life. And those things is all available right now, but nobody put it together. The only thing is, you know, now with everything that you can do with your iPhone and everything that you can do, we can do this. And the goal will be to have something that's going to be in your cloud. You fly to Boston, you get a cardiac problem, they roll you in surgery room, they said, huh, okay, so I know a lot about this guy, so now I'm going to treat him a different way. I think this is really the future, I really believe that, and, and I'm excited because we're starting a mental health program here in the, in the Valley with one of the best, brilliant, you know, a psychiatrist in the country, Dr. Charles Reason, who work on depression, and we're doing project now with cold plunge and, and sauna. That seems like nothing, right? This is huge, you know, for major depression. And how many of us, you know, all fail, all went through major depression, but we're uh, scared to talk about it. So we're developing a program where we're going to look at the full genetic background of this, and the goal will be to develop a treatment that's going to be personalized for you. So I, I think we started to use it, but we're not do we, doing it in the lab today, but we're starting to recruit people to do it tomorrow. And I, I think um, it, when we say the word AI, there are very, very sophisticated people that have a very specific description of what that means mathematically, and it's different than other deep learning or other machine learning, and sometimes we group all of these things together. And I'm not even sure that the experts, these are buzzwords that, that just mean analyzing large parts of data in more than the five or six dimensions than you and I can think in, and then extracting pieces of information. So we use that, for example, in two ways in my life. One is on the clinical side, because we, at the Cleveland Clinic, we do over 4,000 or 6,000, I think, joint replacements a year, and people have different experiences in the hospital, we can take that experience of people's height, weight, age, complications, comorbidity, anesthesia history, how long ago, how far do they have to drive to get home, do they live in a one or two story house, do they have a spouse or a, or a live-in caregiver that is, that is reliable, and we can aggregate that data and we can get pretty accurate with respect to how likely are, are they going to be to need an ICU, how likely are they to be able to go home, how likely are they to need to go to a, a skilled nursing center. How likely are they to have complications or associated with something that might be reversible like depression beforehand? You brought this up. So th that, that is being used now, and that's, that's kind of an artificial intelligence um, attribute, but it's not the sophisticated math that, that can be done. The other side of my life is taking an image that might be 60 gigabytes, and then going into that image and, and asking the question, well, what what part of that image has uh, the highest quality cell, or what part of this image is falling off track and might be a cancer or a, or a mutation that's developed in this population. So there, we have huge numbers of amounts of data, 
and we can apply tools that you and I can't do with our eye. I mean, we can test 100 to, uh, to well, actually, one example, we tested 1,280 different ways to measure texture in an image at a variety of different scales of roughness, and came down to 6 to 12 that were discriminating between high-quality cells and low-quality cells. You can't do that without the math associated with AI. So that's true artificial intelligence. But both ways, they're using large data sets and getting results that we can't just intuit ourselves. Well, for our last question comes from our Zoom audience, and I'm gonna adjust it to have you quickly summarize. What are two things you see coming up on the horizon that you're most excited about in this field? Let's start first. So I'll, I guess I could go first. Well, me I mean, obviously being able to deliver, you know, if you're a manufacturer, <clears throat> The, the, of anything, if it's cars or batteries or houses or rockets, it's the starting materials you, used to, you use and have access to and the reliability and the reproducibility that determines how well you can control the process and how consistently you can deliver an end product. So what's exciting is that not just in the things I do, but the things that so many other people are do, doing, um, you know, are refining that down so that now we have control over things that we could never do before. This is going to give us an opportunity to get a window into a lot of things and also potentiate. So one inspiring example I have as a, as a, as a colleague who I, I, won't, I won't name to embarrass him, but he, he should be really proud of this. Uh, he has a daughter who has a you know, rare inherited condition, and he has been just scouring the opportunities available to, to in, enhance research because who does research on rare conditions? One. It's a very small market, so not too many companies are interested. And two, it, even if it's interesting, it's not something that scientists can get access to very often, because if, if there's only 2,000 people affected in the United States, how likely are you as a scientist to get cells from any one of them, or, or a thousand of them? And so he's taking it upon himself to, to lower the energy barrier by making it possible for children to provide cells that can go into a bank and generate induced pluripotent cells that are representative of their mutation and then make that available to researchers who can then accelerate the rate at which now they could, now if I'm a researcher, I could go out and get 20 different children who had that condition and start to study it. So it could really accelerate the process of discovery in, in, in those little niches that have been until now neglected. Me, you know, I think, um, like I, I talk about, my goal would be to predict disease in the future, and, and, and because for many cases, people who have cancer, they fail the battles because we don't find the right chemotherapeutic drugs for them, and, and we lose them in the meantime because we test a drug A and drug B, drug B, drug C, those people get sick, and you never find the right combination of drugs and the patient died. Banking your stem cells, you know, will be, we all think about banking your stem cells being one thing to help to, to repair our heart, our liver, but what if now you bank your stem cells down the road and you get leukemia? And we know now that stem cells can differentiate it into cancer cells. We do know that now. Think about it. So you go and see the doctor, and the doctor said, hey, you have leukemia stage four, and, and we have to start you on chemotherapy. And you said, hey, wait a minute, uh, doctor. I have my stem cell bank, you know. Can you test your toxic drug on my culture dishes first? And if they kill my cells there, maybe that's the combination I want. All those small things like this will change the way we bring treated. And, and, and the biggest problem we have now, we have to educate the next generation of doctor to not think about one disease, but think about a human person. Because you, 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 sometimes you start, you know, you have a joint problem, you end up with ankle problem, now you need a hip and everything. Everything is linked. So I, I really believe that now, you know, we have specialists in Alzheimer's, specialists in osteoarthritis. I see in the future being specialists on aging related disease. And I'm going to tell you something. We're doing clinical trials right now, right? We're trying to delay your osteoarthritis in your knee. But you can be sure that I look in your blood for biomarkers in the brain. Because if I'm successful to delay this in your knee by using antifibrotic agent and, and senolytic agent to reduce inflammation, I might be able to reduce 
neurodegeneration in your brain too because those drugs go everywhere. So I really believe that we need help to combine. You know when we discovered the full genome? You remember, you know, in the early 2000s, they said, hey, we're going to discover the full genome and we're going to know all the disease, we're going to cure everything. You know what we found? Too much information. What do we do with this? We need help, we need people, we need artificial intelligence, we need people to try to crunch this data together and try to make model out of it. Because I guarantee you, there is a lot of thing in your gene that can predict for something. The problem is, we have all the data here, but nobody put it all together and said, this is the data for Johnny Uart, and this is him. And now let me try to walk back and let me try to develop a treatment for him to try to deliver, to try to delay aging as long as possible. So this is really my dream, is really not to be reactive, but to be preventive, to try to, delay, to try to detect disease before they come and start to treat you today for something that you're going to develop tomorrow. And I believe that if we do that, I think we're going to, we're going to cure disease. And that's really, you know, uh, but it's sad because some of us are already afflicted with those diseases today. But think about our, our kids. Think about, you know, our kids that are growing up, that if they all do this, they all bang their stem cells, they all everything, we're going to give them a chance to live longer and live healthier too. So that would be my, my thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. One more thing. So, so as I was thinking more about your question, the other really good thing that's happened that I think I'm excited about and, and, that, I, and that I think is a transition we're taking and, and, and succeeding in, in transitioning is the initial hype about stem cells and calling these stem cells. And, you know, I showed you that Starbucks, you know, kind of model. And, and the danger is there's excitement and there's somebody who thinks, ah, oh, I, this is a stem cell, I read these two articles, I've got these patients, I can you know, rent space in a, in a shopping mall nearby, I can use a centrifuge, I'll inject whatever I get in, into people's knees, I'll charge them money, they'll get better, the world will be happy. And they, sometimes they're just naive, right? And so, so that part of the excitement of people who just think they can read a few articles and know what to do and then, and then capitalize on the opportunity that's been created, those are going away. The, the Federal Food and Drug Administration has gotten on top of that. They've gotten a lot of help now from the, from the Federal Trade Commission who has much, much more resources to kind of do the whack-a-mole thing of, you know, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. And the world is starting to become filled with more people and Johnny has been a fabulous leader here who asked the right question, what if, and then they organized a study. You saw in his slides, study after study after study after study. So if he's gonna do something, he's gonna learn if it works, fail early, change the plan, but not put anybody at undue risk in the process. That's, that's the secret, I think, of how we're gonna be successful and, 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 and avoid the, the risk that's inherent in, the, in this world um, if, and, and be successful at it. Our, uh, our thanks to Dr. Bobby Lipnick and this beautiful venue and Drs. Johnny Heward and George Mueschler. How about one more round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.